Uh, hello, hello. My name is Antoine Hunter. Also known as Purple Fire Crow. Welcome, welcome. Today we're going to have a panel. We're going to interview artists. We're going to start first by recognizing the land that we are on. We are on the land of the Ohlone tribe here in Oakland, California. So I just wanted to begin by recognizing our indigenous brothers and sisters. Let me first describe who I am and what I am look like in image description. I have locks. I have dark chocolatey skin. I got that from my mother. And I also have a bushy beard. I'm wearing a tighter collared shirt buttoned and it's gray and it has white stripes horizontal stripes i have a plain background a maroon color i am of cherokee heritage myself and african-american so that is who i am so again, Antoine Hunter, aka Purple Fire Crow. Hope you all are just as excited to be here as I am. It is a huge honor. So today, what we're going to do is we are going to show uh, some artists that are part of the Soma Arts Exhibit. We have artists and art from around the world. Let me show you some. And let me show you the banner. So this goes from January to February 21st. Thank you, Soma Arts, for partnering with us. And so before we go ahead with the next part of the event, let me introduce our two interpreters who are going to be supporting us throughout the afternoon today. So come on up, interpreters. My beautiful BIPOC interpreters. Um, um, who are you? Jay. Let's start off with Jay. Introduce yourself, hi Jay. Kay and Kaylee. Cool. Thank you for providing your service today. Thank you for providing your services today. Peace. Two amazing interpreters. They are great interpreters, both of them. So, um, today. So how we're going to proceed today is we're going to have a chat with the artist one-on-one -on -one and then a panel style. And then when we finish with that, we're going to have a discussion, ask some questions. The audience will be able to participate, propose their own questions. And then when we're finished with that Q&A time, we're going to watch some workshops. Uh, Is that fun? Yeah. You all excited? Okay, great. <laughs> so let me share my screen. Oh. 
we were able to secure different artists and curate art from all over the deaf community. Uh, we focused on the Bay Area. And so that's who we're going to be having a discussion with today and focusing our attention. We have such diverse artists in the mix, gay, straight. So first we're going to start with Orchid. Orchid grew up in Long Island, about 20 miles, 25 miles from Manhattan. Her family left Tehran, Iran during the Stormy Revolution of 1979. And then the rest of her bio goes into her history, her degrees, her educational background. It talks about her gallery exhibitions, her time in New York City. Very impressive. Wow, look at her resume. Went to Parsons School of Design in New York City. A lot of different hands-on experience, a wealth of knowledge. She went to San Francisco State University and graduated with her master's degree there in interior design. And she also has a position working in the library. She's been there for many years as a library technical assistant at the San Francisco Library Deaf Services. She's amazing. So please help me oh my god what is that well this is film from the 90s this was from one of the events it comes from Heavy duty equipment. I was um, worried that the slides, because they're so old, that they would, you know, just like disintegrate and dry out. But I was able to um, put them in the camera and see that, you know, it is still operable. I was able to play around with it. I was able to put it in one of my cameras. Let me let me grab it and show you. This is my Nikon. It's not a digital camera. Nice, nice. Before I start, how are you? Busy. I'm a mom. I love my son so much. But they drive me crazy. You know, being a parent, it's it requires a lot of attention and with homeschool right now whew, a lot going on in life you got to love parenthood i know mm -hmm. and it's a, oh, such a blessing to have you know i noticed that you went to different universities schools wow wow you, you just seem you know, quite motivated. You know, are we gonna bring some of that inspiration today? Well, I actually went for a different pur purpose. I represent my community and my family when we arrived um, in the US. You know, it was really hard for others to understand our situation. You know, it was always, us versus them and it was seen that uh, the perspective was that we were in the wrong and so many people watched the news and just didn't understand 
what was happening and they just believed that news story face value, you know, and didn't understand our perspective, our life experience. It wasn't, you know, that we were, you know, bad, awful. No, there's just so many misunderstandings and there's a long extensive history. So when my family moved here, it really was such a culture shock for us. And they wanted to go back when the situation died down and resolved in their home country, but eventually ended up just really settling down and planting roots here. And so my family's been here ever since. Yeah. You know, sticking around, having that culture that you can stick with, you know, taking one culture, engrossing yourself in another, it's making yes. you really good. But the sad part is, is that my culture wasn't really passed down. And so my son doesn't really have any understanding of what that culture is. Interesting. You know, because we are not from here, but when you settle in a new land, you know, your parents have goals and visions for you and being able to travel, you know, is, is a dream. And so I'm hoping to be able to pass down some culture. Yeah, it's, you know, it's quite fascinating because it's the emotional journey that, that you live on, uh, that your life is. You know, I look at your art um, that you've gave us in the gallery. It's so emotional. I'm just going to show, kind of get a, a taste, you know, the blueprint of your art. Mm hmm mm hmm Oh, I'm, I'm excited. You didn't tell me about that. Oh, uh, I'm giving a, a tease to the audience. They're like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, they're hanging on, but. Ah, uh, audience, go ahead and get it. Go into the gallery to see more. But let's talk a little bit more about that last, uh, that last picture, that last photo. Well, I don't know if you know some of my original work. Back in the day, I was on a project called Being Death and Free. Mm -hmm. And that was a, an exhibit shown in black and white. Let me show you some samples from my project. So that Being Death and Free Spirit, that work was focused on the community. And that was a two year long project. And once I finished with that, I kind of migrated and shifted over to playing with flowers, rain. I was really, really energized and motivated by photography and nature. And so there's a poster that has a flower. And the, the story behind that is frustration. I wanted people to think about what does that mean? And I wanted them to be able to decipher that for themselves. And so that red shows that frustration, that, that trigger. And I, I promise it's real. I captured it at a close up and I continue to get closer and closer and closer until you are able to see that shown in the photograph. And I really wanted people to have an attachment, to have an emotional connection. And so that red and that flower as, as it comes in closer really fosters the imagination. And there's a, one of my works is called Hungry. And it, you can see like a bug close up an insect, so close. And so there's many, many layers of my work. What does hungry mean? You know, does that mean satisfied? Does that mean you're, you're, dis, you're not satisfied? Does that mean something of physicality, you know, and 
that Polaroid work, that using that instant film, let me show you, I'll, I'll show you my Diana camera. This, this is the work from the Diana camera. So to have that, that texture, that film, be able to capture that, you know, this was before digital photography. So it's so nice to have that physical photo that to be able to hold it, to be able to hold that thing. And, you know, deaf hearing, regardless, you know, it's so nice to have something that you can touch. There's that element of physicality. I know this conversation is something that we want to dive more and more into, um, but you know, I'm gonna bring you back uh, so we can have a group discussion. So bye-bye for now. See you a little later. See you soon. Wow. I know that was so short and brief, but don't worry. We're gonna go back and talk with Orchid again for more discussion in a little bit. I know some of you wanna know more details right now, but hold on a moment. And we're gonna introduce our next artist. Next is my friend, John. Let me show you his bio so you have an idea of his background. Okay, so this is John. He became deaf at 18 months old. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri. They never were able to figure out the cause of his deafness, but he was taught with the oral method as well as manual education. He graduated from the Florida School of the Deaf and Blind before going on to Rochester Institute of Technology, where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering Technology. He graduated in 1991 and then went on to Brigham Young University. And he graduated in 1996. Wow, went to school back to back to back. But John wasn't satisfied with his career. He was a lost soul. So he heard of a phenomenal city, San Francisco. And so he moved to San Francisco, which was a mecca for radical movements. He focused on his art And there he really thrived in his identity as a deaf, gay, and distinctive artist. He was able to embrace his identity. However, he was working through PTSD and depression and he found that art was able to provide healing. It was his therapy. And so he was able to express himself through his art using mixed media expressionism. He was able to open himself up to the world and be his authentic self. So John, welcome. Come on to the stage. Hello. Uh, it's good to see you, Antoine. How are you? I'm good. I'm flying, creating, drawing, reading. 
Uh, of course, it's a life of a roller coaster, but uh, all things considered, I'm doing well. I'm really happy to see you. I'm so excited that you're here. Same. That jacket, though, it's tight. Yeah, I love, you know, it's this African print. Yeah, so sorry, I'm taking some of your artwork. Mm. Well, thank you for coming today. I was doing some reading about mental health and yeah. all the different avenues and paths to healing. And you found art, you know, a, a way to heal. Is that right? Yes. Yes. You know, looking back, whew, you know, growing up, you know, trying to find a deaf identity was prohibited. I wasn't allowed. And things just compounded. And then, you know, my gay identity, you know, more oppression, digging it deep within, not being able to reveal. You know, I've, I was stuck in a world where I couldn't imagine, couldn't express myself. And so my imagination, my creativity, my gayness wanted to come out. But I was afraid of myself as well. But now I have no fear. My life is glorious. I think it's amazing that you are able to really find yourself and follow your own path. You know, you saw people going this way and that way, and you went with what was best for you. Was that easy to work through that process? Or was that something that, you know, you had to really navigate through with your art? Yeah, good question. You know, moving to San Francisco, you know, I hit, I hit rock bottom. And I, I felt like, Death moving here. No, I, I felt a lack of movement. You know, my soul was gone. You know, I was trying to, my lost soul, how could I get it back? And so I started moving with heart. And, you know, I was just kind of going through the motions, painting, reading, sewing, you know, one day, one day, and another. And then, you know, I started thriving with my art and I felt kind of this relief. And, and I, then I elected to kind of create mixed art, mixed media art. And I started working on it and started taking creativity from different things like hammers and sawing um, and um, I became, you know, a beautiful man with these hands. Um, and so I'm, I'm extremely happy. It's happy, happy, happy now. John, oh, there's a question I wanted to ask you. Your art that's shown in the gallery, do you mind if we show that to the audience now? Sure, yeah. This is called Firebird. Tell me about that. It is a big, large, large piece of art. Tell me, explain the color. There's a lot of emotion that comes through. Yeah, you know, funny thing. So that piece, Firebird.
you know, when I was at my lowest, I started drawing, but I felt this fire, you know, I got this fire with inside, you know, and I put that art away and I'm, then I brought it back. Uh, and then I elected to, you know, create a mural. And, and I wasn't content. You know, I wanted more work with the hands. I wanted to show that more. So I, I, I elected to start cutting it in pieces. And so it was a three-part piece. And I started kind of massaging that. And then I started cutting it again. And I, I cut off the arms of that mural. And then I, and it became built and it just built it on that. And, and when the creation was done, I just had this fire. But I felt... I was like, what was it so big for? I couldn't fit it in my room. Uh, it was just kind of lingering in my art studio. And I couldn't imagine why I made something so big. Why did I spend all of that time, that energy? What was the point? This is something every time I would imagine while looking at this art. And then so I realized doing an assessment of myself, I had PTSD. So post-traumatic stress syndrome. Huh. And I just started unlayering who I was. And that's hard work. It's hard for me to call out of myself. You know, you got to have that strength. You know, to push myself to keep going. And to get deep, to get to the nitty and gritty. You know, I had no identity at that point. And so I, you know, I reluctantly, you know, accepted my deaf identity. And what was within came out. No, what's that power? You know, it's like gas, you know? It was like that gas I needed. That was the fuel and it just, it was profound. And I realized my art is therapy and it's my sex success to mental health. Wow. My art is my therapy. Therapy. It's so therapeutic. I want to be able to bring Orchid back into this conversation so that the three of us can can expound. So Orchid, come on back. Hi, Orchid. Hello. Hi, Antoine. The two of us have met before at the Gare. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And that was in the early 2000s in the San Francisco Bay Area. But we didn't know, you know, who, there was so many there. We didn't really know each other. That's where we met, though. Yeah. When we met, you know, you changed my life. You have been a significant and salient feature of my artwork. You know, I was, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, that person that was also there, you know, had passed away. Yeah, they were so prominent in our art community and they never stopped making art. They never stopped. It was so, spontaneous and it really told such a story and for them to be able to bring that forth and show their life through their art to be able to put themselves out on the stage like that that was i wonder yeah yeah 2020 
I was thinking um, and really just reflecting about that. And oh, was that a, were you dreaming or? No, I was just having some memories, you know, just, just looking back and thinking about that time. And Orchid is saying, yes, yeah, so many of us gathered together. I don't know who lives in San Francisco, but it was a big thing. It was a big deal. There were a few deaf artists included in that show too. John, you were there and and we were able to meet and it, it was so powerful because we hadn't met before, you know, and to be able to see that um, that art and it was so loud and so powerful and so much color shown and it just portrayed the deaf experience. Antoine is saying, yes, it was an honor to be able to meet him there. Guy Wonder was a legend. And I saw his work from his beginning days up until now, and he left such a legacy. So this gallery that we're doing in San Francisco now, I think there's still some that haven't met each other, but we're here doing our exhibit through Soma Arts. And I'm wondering, why doesn't this happen more often? The deaf artists, you know, where are they in, in the San Francisco Bay Area? You know, why is this happening so sporadically and so, so sparingly? Yeah, a few reasons. You know, the Bay Area has become ex extremely expensive. Second reason, San Francisco has changed a lot over the years. You know, art was vibrant within San Francisco, but then tech popped up here, tech industries popped up here and kind of, kind of dilapidated the art. And so art was, you know, a scarcity. And so all deaf artists, you know, were gent gentrified. Yeah, it was definitely pushed out. You know, and, and you know, with those scarce resources, you know, before there was just an, uh, you know, an array of support, but now there's just a scarcity. Orchid is saying in the early 2000s, there were many deaf artists, like deaf, deaf bear, Derek and several, several deaf artists who did painting and murals. And I don't know if it was deaf theme, but there was a market um, at a local college that showed portraits, paintings, landscapes, different types of arts that you could buy. And, you know, that showed a connection and we were able to show deaf work, but it's hard today. It's hard, you know, to be able to afford living in the city. It's, it's the cost of living has skyrocketed. You know, we're working three and four jobs. And so to buy art and to buy work and to be able to afford that in addition to just making it by, it's hard, you know? And it, this is our, our profession and it's hard to be able to make a living. And, you know, I, I wanna kind of expand on what Orchard had mentioned. You know, deaf art, you know, the hearing world, you know, you, you, know, you don't see deaf art in galleries. You know, that's the problem as well. We're excluded from that. 
Orchid is saying. And many people don't have any idea that uh, that there are deaf artists, that there is deaf art. What is the name? I think it's Granville. Granville, you know what I'm talking about? The famous impressionist, the American painter. I think yes, it's yeah. Granville. Nice, yeah. He was famous for landscapes, very well known. And if you look at his story on YouTube, Ken Culver goes into his background and his story and they expand on his history. So you can look at that on YouTube because he was a landscape artist. And so that was before the cost of living had skyrocketed and he was deaf, but he wasn't immersed in the deaf community. So many didn't know that. Other artists such as Tilden Sculptor. Yeah, I think it was Tilden. Tilden Douglas. Is that who you're speaking of? Yes. Yes. Those two. Along with Granville. They died in poverty, unfortunately. Everyone knows who they are now. After death, but during life they didn't have that notoriety. Antoine is saying, uh, yes, and it's kind of similar for scientists. People don't know who they are and they will come up with an invention and it will change the course of things. But another, person will get the credit and the breakthrough because they got the publicity, they had the support, they had, you know, the politics behind them to back them. So really, you know, who are, are you around? Who's working to support you? That makes a huge difference. And so to be able to put together this gallery of deaf artists, this is going to be known throughout the lands of the earth. So that was a deep question about why our deaf art should stay. You know, our, our our culture is something that's generationally passed down. You know, our art, our language is visual. You know, deaf, deaf expression, deaf stories, deaf examples, poetry, you know, everything is deaf art. It is folklore. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Orchid, did you want to add anything? I'm just thinking what, one moment. I grab this photo for you. Oh, yes, yes. This was Granville, the uh, guy, guy wonder. Uh, that's an example. You have to remember that the perspective and points of view of art, everyone has a different perspective. And so that devia, that concept of the art, you know, we we agree that he initiated that. 
It's about, you know, a deaf moment in deaf space. And it concentrates our attention on that moment. We're able to see a deep meaning behind that photo, but it's it's a tough debate. You know, it's not something that was born yesterday. We've been having this debate for quite some time. We've, we've talked about these two deaf artists and the different points of view that they held. And it's just important to remember to dive in. jump into the art and immerse yourself in the history. You know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm right on board with Orchid. You know, developing and cherishing the love of your identities. You know, my deaf art, you know, it's mixed. My love for deaf art is mixed, yes. You know, it's it's these rules, these rules and rules and rules and, you know, does my deaf art show my deaf, my deaf identity? Not, not often. Now, in, until I was able to identify with who I was by maybe taking a deaf, class and getting that deaf hood. So what do we do? So deaf artists show, show your identity within your art. And there's gotta be this balance between identifying with people who don't identify with you. And then also making art that just doesn't reflect your deaf identity, but reflect and in combining all of those strings, stringing those strings together. Uh, or could, who did you say? Granville. But for that, like for that one, he, he didn't demonstrate his deaf art. You know, it, it's really just accepting who you are and accepting your type of art and developing that and just allowing your energy and for like my energy, just allowing my energy to flow. Oh, this is Antoine, my mind is being blown right now. So much information and knowledge. But identity, to have somebody take that from you or label you as something no, we need to reject that. You are who you are. And it's not others' responsibility to try to create your identity for you. Their responsibility is to form their own identity and accept others for who they are. So that's how we grow. That's what humanity is. Both of you, this has been amazing, this discussion. Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. All right, now people, before time runs out, submit your questions in the chat box. I did see a few come through already.
Why push stuff art away? Let's see, another question. Okay, this is directed to both of you. Who inspires you? John, do you want to go first? Orchid is posing. Uh, sources that inspire me. You know, I, I study a lot of Western history. You know, a lot of Eastern influence. And so here is, you know, kind of my art inspiration as an American artist. You know, I, I've been influenced by all kinds of, um, and so one prominent salience feature of my inspiration is African-American history art. It's that color, the incidence, the in, instant innocence. You know, I, I'm self-taught. You know, African art history is kind of where I get my colors and my vibrations from. Yeah, if you see people, you know, watching jazz, you know, many people were inspired by jazz and Black African American culture. You know, jazz has its roots in our culture. And many people were inspired by that. So I, I understand what you're saying, John. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to actually piggyback off that. You know, when America was founded uh, and our African individuals came through slavery, working and working and building this country, everything we see, all of this arts, everything is predicated on African people. Yeah, and I mean, we didn't come by choice. Yes. We were forced over. And I was shocked. The, the White House itself was built by slaves. You know, Black people really built, really built this country. But you were talking about, um, you know, Western design and, and Western culture. And so I, I wanted to mention that about the White House. but. Did you want to add anything, Orchid? Well, I studied photography um, and, you know, just seeing what's at the museum, they run so parallel. I worked in the Gallaudet basement for two years, you know, playing and, and developing my craft. But that was actually cut, that program, and so then I went on to study European painting at museums in DC. I was fascinated by that, especially with impressionist work. You know, that, that light, showing that light in the moment. And so that really merged seamlessly together with photography. We were able to, you know, study how people moved. And within that study of photography, I was able to learn about different identities. I was able to see so many people. And with Ouija, Antoine is saying, what is Ouija? W-E-E-G-E-E. -E -E -E. Ouija. Ouija. Easy. You'll have to look that up. That was uh, the police radio. And they would take photos of corpses and and they would do close up photography. And so studying that I was able to find a, a unique style. 
and Leibovitz, a famous female photographer. She wrote down two options. One was family and friends. You develop your skills and they help you to develop your foundation. So your community and your family. Does the audience have any more questions or you, Antoine? As for pushing deaf art away, we need to support deaf artists. You know, people expect us to give away our art without compensation. People think, oh, I can't afford deaf art, it's expensive. And so instead they'll look for, you know, things from China or Holland, the Dutch, you know, but we have such skills and the materials, you know, cost money. We have to be compensated. Yeah, I get it. You know, you know, deaf people are tend to not allow, uh, they're not hired as often, they're pushed out. So how does deaf people support other deaf people? You know, we have our own challenges within our own community. You know, some people have privileges to be able to ha to buy and purchase deaf art, but this is far and in between. So let's get to the next question. In other words, do you prefer to call yourself a deaf artist or simply an artist? Or could the saying, I prefer just artists. John? It depends on who's asking. You know, if it's, you know, the hearing uh, individual uh, may ask me, yeah, I'm an artist. If a deaf person asks me, I'm a deaf artist, yeah. Oh, and then they're like, oh, can you show me? Can you show me? Can you show me? You know, you know, chatting, you know, with people, you know, I tell people, you know, I'm a dancer, I'm an artist, I'm a director. Some people are like, oh, okay. And then I add, you know, I'm a deaf artist, I'm a deaf producer. And then people are like, hmm. So that's, my different careers are, get smaller and smaller. Oh, you know, you know, our art world, artists is, is a small world. So if I identify as just uh, as one thing, then I, I shrink my world. So it's expanding my world in being and identifying who I am. You know, you know, it's, it's with you know, communication uh, access, you know, hearing people don't understand the complications that we experience. If deaf people had to understand, had to explain and educate, you know, then they may get a better understanding, but, you know, without an interpreter, you know, we are, our resources are limited. That's so true. Question for both of you. How do you do artwork while deaf ASL person expresses in poems? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Did you guys, uh, did you guys understand the question? Um, actually, I'm not sure as well. I do do expressive and, and poetic work a lot of bold movements. You know, some people just think that sign language is just limited to that of only sign. And some people think that I'm just limited to being a dancer. You know, dancing is a way that I can fully express myself. It's 
you know, how do you put words in being able to express myself, but movement, you know, people understand, you know, in, words limit me. You know, ASL allows me to expand uh, for people to understand me, but my movement allows the world to understand me. You know, I think, you know, with your guys' artwork, it allows you to explain and who you are and what you would like to get across. John, I think you had shared that a little bit. John said yes and no. Uh, I think those are two different questions. You know, ASL poetry and deaf artwork. Yes, there is both. Is artwork poetry? Yes. You know, there is some of the art that I have that has a message. So like the Firebird piece. So the fire phoenix. So we would take that English concept, right? Just those that language and see how it could be expressed just like this. And so that's Firebird, taking the English form and pulling it out in a poetic way. So it's layers. So deaf art has a layer of poetry. So that, I hope that answered your question. So another question is when deaf artists try to display their work, there's so much focus on our deafness. It seems our art gets lost. Have you experienced this? Yes. Like in my, for example, in my photography, sometimes my photographs get lost. For example, Brenda Swartz, a wonderful woman. Brenda Swartz. I think I spelled her name correctly. Uh, I think so. If not for her support, you know, she was the first person to really back me up. And without that, I, I really don't know if my photography would have been as prominent. That photographer? She's a deaf a deaf woman. She's an educator within the community, loves art herself. She goes to the museum often. You know, she's wonderful, a wonderful person. And she was the first person that made me feel optimistic that, you know, my work could make it. Other people in the community don't necessarily have that mindset. And so to be able to shift that and to be able to follow into my my dreams and my my goals with her support was so helpful. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. So um, I'm gonna propose the last question. Question is, what is your advice for young people who desire an art for the future. John? It's a tough one. So my advice. Knowledge is power. How does that apply to artwork though? Well, you know, my art was something that was developed. I studied history. Uh, art, fashion, music, I mean, everything, it was just kind of the study. So everything that I was doing, I was taking in, was being layered on top of myself that I could portray within my art. Don't, and then don't be too hard on yourself. You know, I, I'm one of those artists, you know, who, you know, heavily criticizes myself, yeah. And it's far often that you see artists do, but don't give up. 
you know, once you once you pursue art now and whatever you're producing, it's something that you can love. You know, it's just like uh, you know when you're uh, you're growing a tree or a plant. It's something that doesn't seem uh, worth to love. Just giving everyone a just hey, these are some secret tips, y'all. Y'all better catch catch these. Go out into nature. That's my first tip. Practice. Practice makes perfect. That's what the secret is. If you want to do portraits, you can Pick somebody who is a close family member. You don't have to pay a model. Use the resources that you have in front of you, such as Van, Van Gogh. Yes, Van Gogh, this is the sign, yes. Van Gogh. Yep, this is the sign. You know, that's, that's exactly what Van Gogh oh, did. Another story for another day. Mm -hmm, many people don't know. Yeah, that's another story for another day. So don't be afraid to go to museums, study the work of the pillars in our field. Be curious. Ask yourself why they use that line, that curvature, the texture, the colors. You will develop your skills over time. Interesting, yeah. Some some artists, you know, some artists, you know, they try to keep you down from growing. Other artists elevate you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, I'm lucky. So I went to uh, CalArts. You know, there wasn't a lot of. Uh, exposure to the type of art that I wanted. And, you know, I had to go seek it. You know, it's something that uh, hands on. You know, power is knowledge and it saved my life. John? So understand, School and no school. If you can, if you go to an educational institution, you may just become like everyone else. Oh, look at oh, she brought her cat. John. So if you maybe you, you didn't go to school, you may have a different fascination for something. And so those who go to school versus those who don't. Uh, there is a separate, there is a difference between the two. Oh, such a cute cat. Thank you so, so much, you two. Thank you for sharing your mind, your wisdom. Thank you for bringing your art into the gallery. Y'all made the gallery beautiful. Hey, people, let me know you. Let me let me let me tell you. At the end of this workshop, I'll show you how to access the virtual gallery. So I'll teach you, so don't worry. And one more thing, if you see my artwork and you want to know how to order it, um, we can show you how to order online. Here's some samples of my work. You can contact me. Anytime. Okay, back to you, Antoine. No, great, great. So you two can go for now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, wow. Did y'all learn today? I know you guys need some time to let that marinate.
chew on what we learned today. Let it maybe touch your heart. Figure out how to move on, move forward. They're amazing people, just sweet, brilliant. They are dedicated artists. You know, it's looking at it through a deaf lens. And revealing that to you. Cool, right? Don't go away. We're going to take five minutes, have an intermission, uh, and then we'll be back and uh, start the workshop. So maybe go, go get, go get some water, but don't, don't miss, don't miss it. Now uh, there's going to be this workshop. You're going to, it's going to, you're going to respond to it in a different way. So make sure you come back to get it, to get that. All right. So see you in five. Hmm? Who's looking at me? Who's looking at me? Oh, deaf eyes, strong, 
death eyes. Oof. No, 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 no. These thick frames, real lenses. Wow. Lord be with me. Whew. Oh, careful, my neighbor. Oh, is a scary woman. Happy spirit. Imagine sitting, thinking. I suspect this person is deaf. Why? Look, 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 look. Looking at, look at the eyes. Very inquisitive. Deaf, that's what I sense, he's deaf. Stop, stop looking at me, you're scaring me. You scared me. Oh. I'm crying, I'm upset. Crying. Tears of joy. Ooh, oh. Heart. Hmm. I don't love you. I love you. I love you. You. Bye. Bye bye. Bye 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 bye. See this airplane? I'm making rice. Have some vegetables. My dinner. Meet my friend. He's gotta fix his hair a little bit. Really? Oh, oh, one moment. Oh, 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 really, 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 come on. Hmm, 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 hmm. 
COVID getting worse and worse. Who's that? Oh, they think they're important. Look how they're sitting. Ah, oh, forget. Forget him. COVID. Make sure you wear your mask. You know, I imagine that this is a very important world. Woman saving the environment. Maybe. This art piece, Tearful Joys. Ah, cry. I love art. Ah, 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 ah. Ah. Tears of joy. My next art project is called Tears of Joy. This is my next art project, Tears of Joy. Yeah, yeah. Huh? You smell that? What is that? Oh, look at those boots. Whoo! Ooh, thanks. Yeah, that's that smell. God help me. Wish someone away. I feel I'm being watched. This is a private conversation. He seems lost. A lost man. Where is his home? Wondering. Let's help him find his home. Hey, hey, your home is right there. He's really lost his mind. Look at these two in love, making out. There's one woman admiring, it's just beautiful. Someone's looking at me. Ah, deaf eyes, strong deaf eyes. Whew. La, 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 la. Real lenses. Wow. Wow, 
Did y'all enjoy that? And on to Miss Orchid. Hello everyone, let me introduce myself. My name is Orchid Sassoni. I'm a deaf artist participating in the BADA Bay Deaf Area Arts exhibit with Soma Arts. Thank you for having me as a part of this event. I'm thrilled to be here. This is my second exhibition with Soma Arts. I have collaborated with them before. Today, I really wanna take this time to show you a demonstration here are different cameras in front of me. These are instant film cameras. So I'm gonna just explain a little bit about them. I'm gonna show you some cool features that they have. I've been studying photography uh, since 1994, 1996, 98. That time frame is really when I started uh, to study photography and develop my craft. I was working with analog photography that is using actual film and Polaroids using huge uh, huge um, film that would be dispensed and at that time it was quite costly to process these photographs it was about ten dollars per sheet and around that time that would be worth about twenty five dollars per per sheet around the, the eight, late 80s and 90s so quite quite expensive during that time. I really got into photography and developed my passion working with Donna McLeod, a very famous photographer at the university, Gallaudet University. There I played with film. I then went on to New York City and I studied at Parsons School of Design. I majored in photography there. And I gained experience doing an internship with Annie Leibowitz. Seeing her work was fascinating. She developed the theory of photographing with family and with your community. And so I did both. I worked with my family and friends in the deaf community. And they are very different. The tough part really is handling the flash. That's normal, that's a deaf thing, you know, dealing with that distraction on the eye. And I worked on a project called Deaf Free Spirit. And so today I'm going to show you some of my favorite pieces of equipment. I have so much fun using these. The first one, this is an Instastax. Very user friendly. Almost all pieces of equipment are going to be expensive, I must warn you. This is a Lomography camera. And again, this Instasax Polaroid. I recently got a new toy to play with. This is a Polaroid. This is so much fun to use. And this one is also a, a Lomography camera. This is a Diana Instant camera. I just got, the, they developed this about two years ago, fairly recently. And the Diana Instant camera uses film. It looks like plastic 
And so you insert the film and you can add different effects to that. So let me show you a little bit how to use them. These are a Polaroid, you know, Fuji film. So in the around 96, 98 time frame, I was working with a well-known photographer and we really depended on Polaroids. And for that, you would have to take into account lighting, and remember during that time, that was pre-digital photography. When digital photography came onto the scene around 98, it wasn't as modern as it is right now. It was slow. It took a long time to process. It had limited memory and it was a heavy duty piece of equipment that you had to log, lug along with you. So that digital camera at that time again was was very slow it took about an hour to make minor adjustments effects whereas now it's instantaneous but again during that time we were only using polaroids so you had to make your markings you had to prep and that was all before the director approved it you would have to bring it to them for approval during the late 90s during that time we would use these pieces of equipment for faster results the polaroids was the fastest option available to us now we have our phones that we have our camera built in we can just take photos and scroll but i miss the physicality i miss the Polaroids. I liked being able to touch things. The hearing world can rely on their auditory senses, but I, as a deaf person, love visual. I love to touch and feel things and see things in my hands. And that's why I love having this photo of my son with me. I keep it very close, near and dear to my heart. With digital, it's different. You know, on your phone, you have to look for the photo, scroll, scroll, scroll until you find it. With this, it's right near me. Now with this camera to my right, it's a little bit of a challenge for the novice photographer. And let me show you how it works. This is what it looks like on. Now what you do is you take your phone, you have an image up on your phone and you lay it atop of the camera. So the camera is going to take the image from your phone and it's going to it's going to transition that onto your Polaroid film. Here's some examples. Now with this camera, you can make some minor adjustments. And with this, you transition your photo from your phone onto the film. That is not something that you can do with this camera. This camera, a little bit again of a challenge to work with. It does take some skills and experience to be able to understand the ins and outs of the controls. But it is a lot of fun. I do have the most fun with this camera here though. It's fun for any age, any level. Really, this is a great camera to start with. And this Instasax is also really fun for artists. Artists who enjoy playing with those manual controls, the light, the exposure. This is what it looks like on the back.
Do you see how you can play around with the colors? Now this you with this camera you can't trans translate the photos from your phone onto this camera. This is you're actually taking the photo yourself with the piece of equipment. Now you can see here a little bit. The work that you see the ex in the exhibit are larger scale. So the Polaroids are enlarged. And I do most of that with this camera here. So with these, I was walking, just on a walk, and I had my instant camera with me. I was looking for flowers, something that sh showed emotion that you can feel a connection to. This is a palm tree. Wonderful shadow here. And you can see the connection that you can feel with this. You can see in some areas of the leaf, it's darker and others it's lighter. It open and it leans towards the sun, that heliotropism. You can see that happen here. This is another flower. And that yellow is such a bold color. The sun radiates off of it. One of my favorite parts uh, to photograph is that red, oh, no, not the red, the yellow, that pistil of the flower in the center. So wonderful to photograph. This is another poster that I had in the gallery. It's called Hungry. And I wanted the viewers to think about the meaning, for them to understand it from their perspective, for them to see their emotions, to feel themselves opening up. I wanted that to be the viewer's experience because these flowers are emotive. They tell a story. And it does often depend on the context. For example, this photograph behind me, to my left, this was taken on the beach. And it was taken during a storm. The storm was coming and it's windy. That's why those leaves were bent. So I hope that you enjoyed this brief time looking at all of this equipment. Bye-bye. Wow. Wow. Did y'all enjoy that? Amazing. Uh, thank you, thank you, Orchid and John for being with us. So yes, thank you, John. Thank you, Orchid. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your wisdom, your art, you, you know, giving us uh, an, a light into who you are.
Thank you for the interpreters. There's some other people I got to share. I got to say thank you to. Thank you to Soma Arts uh, for partnering with us and allowing me to collaborate or uh, collaborating with them. So yes, February, January 14th through February 21st, uh, the gallery is open. Uh, next week, we'll have another uh, panel and workshop. Uh, so you don't want to miss that same time, same place. And I think that uh, I think that's uh, uh, our last one. And also, we have uh, some movement performed by Urban Jazz Dance Company. So now let's let's uh let me teach you a little bit how to access the gallery. So how do you get into the gallery? So you go to somaarts.org. And once you've accessed the website, you hit learn more. So you'll see the dates listed uh, that you have access to the gallery. There'll be visual description. Uh, the deaf artist's name, the, the project, you'll see what's upcoming. There's even a safety plan. So you scroll down. So you'll see that there is a look, there's an option that you can click saying virtual gallery experience. Yeah, please sign up for the newsletter. You know, so if they have future events, things that are happening, so you can be in the know. Oh, and uh oh, I think we're going in. You ready? I'm trying to drive, and I'm driving. What? 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 Was that too fast? You know, really, you know, I just wanted to give you a taste. I know I teased you a little bit. I wanted you to, I wanted you to get a little taste so you can go in and and get the full experience. We're de uh, developing VR as well, virtual reality. So. So take time, capture everything that you see, that deaf art, a beautiful deaf art. You know, I really hope you enjoyed yourself today. I know I did. So thank you, Urban Jazz Dance Company staff, the volunteers, the community, and you, you who came, watch today. Thank you so much. Thank, so continue sharing. Don't don't just 
Keep it to yourself. Tell everyone. Tell everyone to come next week for the workshop and panel. Your questions today were extraordinary. So bring that energy next week to two more artists that will be uh, exhibiting through our workshop. You know, so that discussion that we'll have, uh, we'll be, you know, learning a little bit more about them. Thank you for the interpreters. Uh, so see you next time. Peace. Love. I'm out.